welcome to the annual awards ceremony of the National Academy of Sciences, where we present a small array of what we think are very important prizes. I have to alert you before we start, though, that the ceremony today is going to be webcast live uh, to viewers all over the United States and who knows where else. And like anything else that's on the web, it may be there forever. So. <laughs> so don't be surprised if you hear from friends and colleagues later. We hope in a positive way. Today we're going to recognize 16 individuals for their outstanding contributions to science. And let me just give you a word about how these nominations and decisions are made. We receive nominations very widely from individuals who nominate other individuals, from scientific societies, from counterpart organizations. And for each of the awards, we have a separate committee which is in place to make a selection from all the nominees. It's quite competitive. They present the recommendations to the Council of the National Academy of Sciences, which never tries to replace a nominee. We have uh, very rarely intercede at all. So the award com selection committees are very, very important. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the nomination details for next year's awards are already posted on some of our websites, so I hope you'll encourage this practice of, of, uh, of generating a very large number of awards nominations for these very competitive prizes. So the first one <clears throat> that, that I will announce and then pass it on to the individual chairpersons of the selection committees, are just to remind you that during uh, the editorial board meeting of the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which was held here this morning, six papers published in PNAS, the journal, in 2013 were awarded the Cozzarelli Prize, which has been named, which was named after uh, two editors previous to Inder Verman, Nick Cozzarelli, who was a tremendous editor of PNAS. So I want to read you the list of the award winners and the titles of the outstanding papers for which they are being uh, recognized. And if there are any of the authors present today, I'd like to ask them, each of them to stand. The first one was in the general category of physical and mathematical sciences. Uh, the paper was entitled, The Prevalence of Earth-Sized Planets Orbiting Sun-Like Stars. Eric Pettigura, Andrew Howard, and Jeff Marcy. Are any of you here? Congratulations. In the general field of biological sciences, Satoshi Kojima, Mimi Kao, and Allison Dope, task-related cortical bursting depends critically on basal ganglia input and is linked to vocal plasticity. Are any of you here? Oh, congratulations. In the engineering and applied sciences, uh, Tad Patchuk, Frank Mahler, and Michael Martyr for the paper entitled, Gas Production in the Barnett Shale Obeys a Simple, simple Scaling Theory. Congratulations. For those of you who haven't kept up with the statistics, publication in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is just becoming more difficult all the time. Only about one out of six papers is accepted for publication, and to be recognized as having the, the outstanding paper amongst that very select group that was published in the first place is quite an honor. The, the uh, Biomedical Sciences class of the Academy the paper being recognized is human placental trophoblasts confer viral resistance to recipient cells. And the list of authors is uh, 12 papers, 12 authors, but they're not listed up here, so I'll read their names. Elizabeth Delorme Axford, Roger Donker, Jean-Francois Millet, Tinjao Chu, Avram Bayer, Bayer Yingxi Uen, Tianyi Wang, 
Donna Stoltz, Salmendra Sarkar, Adrian Morelli, Yol Sadovsky, and Carolyn Coyne. Congratulations. Are any of you here? Congratulations. Good. In the behavioral and social sciences, the outstanding paper, you can read the title there, Historical Collections Reveal Patterns of Diffusion of Sweet Potato in Oceania Obscured by Modern Plant Movements and Recombination. Carolyn Brulier, Laura Bonnois, Doyle McKay, and Vincent Lebeau. Congratulations. Are you here? Good. And finally, in the Applied Biological, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences, neonicotinoid uh, clothianidin ad adversely affects insect immunity and promotes replication of a viral pathogen in honeybees by Gennaro Prisco, Valeria Cavaliere, Desiderato Anosha, Paolo Varicchio, Emilio Caprio, Francesco Nazzi, Giuseppe Giargiulo, and Francesco Panacchio. Congratulations to you. Please stand. Congratulations. Now, for the first of the uh, NAS awards, I want to call on Professor, uh, Dr. Jim Moran, who's a member of the selection committee for the James Craig Watson Medal. Jim? The 2014 James Craig Watson Medal is awarded to Robert P. Kirshner of Harvard University. The citation reads, his work with students using supernova light curves as calibrated standard candles has provided evidence for an accelerating expansion of the universe. The dark energy inferred from this result is one of the deepest mysteries of modern science. Bob is the world's leading expert in supernovae, a certain type of star that spectacularly blows itself to smithereens. The last one to do so was in uh, 1604. Bob wasn't around for that one. <laughs> if a supernova goes off anywhere in our universe of 100 billion galaxies, Bob is often the first person on Earth to see it. One of Bob's earliest achievements, just out of graduate school, was to perfect a technique to measure the distances to supernovae by measuring the rate of expansion of their envelopes. This technique still provides a competitive way to measure the Hubble constant. Another method he developed uh, with a graduate student was critical for the discovery of dark energy. His discovery of a gigantic void, 300 million light years on a side, was a pioneering step leading to our current understanding of the web-like uh, distribution of galaxies throughout the universe. Bob is a teacher of legend at Harvard. In his wildly popular introductory astronomy course, he demonstrates Newton's third law by personally piloting a rocket car that zooms from view through the auditorium doors that open at the last possible instant. <laughs> we don't expect Bob to zoom out of our view anytime soon. Thank you. I, I am delighted uh, to get this wonderful award. When I was president of the American Astronomical Society, I resisted the establishment of more prizes. <laughs> Too much trouble to administer, I said. As of today, my view has changed. <laughs> the concentrated pleasure of the recipient more than balances the diffuse labor of the committee. And the shine of the Watson Medal uh, doesn't come from the gold on its surface, uh, but from the people who have received it before me. Jerry Ostreicher, Margaret Geller, 
Dave Wilkinson, Vera Rubin, Martin Schmidt, to name a few. I'm proud to join that list. Astronomy is a special subject, less applied, but no less important than others. When Ralph Cicerone makes the case for science, he wisely emphasizes the practical benefits. Science leads to technical innovation and economic growth. Good. Science helps solve vexing problems of an unstable world. Good. Advances in science can prolong the lives of members of Congress. Pretty good. <laughs> but being rich and safe and immortal is not the whole story. Human beings are curious. We want to know where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. Astronomy tries to answer those deeper questions. Some science promises benefits on Earth. Some science provides the joy of finding out how the universe works. Thank you very much. The Comstock Prize in Physics will be introduced by Miriam Sarachek, Chair of the Selection Committee. Miriam. Okay, I'm going to tell you about spins. Atoms have spin as if they were spinning around their axis. Described by a spin quantum number, which is an integer, like 1, 2, 3, 4, or a half integer. Atoms with integer spin, called bosons, can all occupy the same level, the same quantum state. Einstein predicted long ago that when bosons approach each other sufficiently close, closely, and are cooled down to sufficiently low temperatures, a dominant fraction of them can occupy the same level, forming a state now known as a Bose-Einstein condensate, where quantum effects are apparent on a macroscopic scale. By contrast, particles with half integer spin, known as fermions, must occupy different states, and they generally stay out of each other's way. Building on her earlier landmark accomplishment of a quantum degenerate Fermi gas, and by careful and imaginative, imaginative use of electromagnetic fields and laser cooling, Deborah Jin, in 2003, succeeded in creating a molecular Bose-Einstein condensate in fermionic atomic gases cooled to less than 100 billionth of a degree above zero. This singular accomplishment is widely regarded as a techn technological and scientific turning point that has led to an explosion of creative science whose richness continues to invigorate atomic, molecular, and optical physics. It is a great pleasure and an honor for me to present the 2014 Comstock Prize to Deborah Jin of the National Institute of Standards and Technology for demonstrating quantum degeneracy and the formation of a molecular Bose-Einstein condensate in ultra-cold fermionic atomic gases and for pioneering work in polar molecular quantum chemistry. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very honored to have been selected for this, this award. Thank you.
The John J. Carty Award for the Advancement of Science will be introduced by Jean Robinson, Chair of the Selection Committee. Jean. The 2014 John J. Carty Award for the Advancement of Science, presented this year in the field of genome biology, is awarded to Joseph L. Derisi of the University of California, San Francisco, for pioneering efforts to develop new genomic technologies and using the technologies. One nominator worried that Dr. Derisi has done so many important things that it will be hard for us to choose which of these accomplishments to cite. I wish that person were here now to help me out, because that's indeed my problem, in 150 words or less, I might add. So let me just share with you three major accomplishments. First, Dr. Derisi's work with Pat Brown to develop microarrays created an entirely new field of genome-wide expression analysis as a linchpin of functional genomics. Second, after developing a method to use microarrays for virus identification, the Derisi lab was one of the first to identify the virus behind the infamous SARS epidemic in, 20, in 2003, setting a new standard of speed and excellence in epidemiology. Third, Dr. Derisi developed a novel system to grow large quantities of the infective forms of a malaria-causing parasite, itself a technical tour de force, and then used this system to identify gene networks involved in causing the disease, providing exciting new therapeutic targets. Still relatively early in his career, Dr. Derisi is widely recognized as a true genomic polymath and is truly deserving of this award. Uh, I am deeply honored to have been selected to receive the John Cardi Award for the Advancement of Science uh, by the Academy. I'd like to thank my colleagues, mentors, supporters, especially the faculty and staff of UCSF, for without them, none of my efforts have, would have been possible. I also thank my family, my parents, for their steadfast love and support. Reading Mr. Carty's biography, I sensed a kindred spirit in the description of his life, where it is clear that he emphasized technological innovation driven by small teams of interdisciplinary researchers cooperating in harmony to push engineering and science of that time telephone systems, which evolved to be the information networks and internet that we have today, which incidentally is how my two daughters, Marina and Alexandra, are watching me here today. Hi, kids. Very good. Had to get that in there. Genomic information systems are the networks and information sciences uh, that are a new frontier today. And I imagine Cardi felt the same way that I do at the beginning of telephone technology. And I promise I will work to maintain the tenacity and drive that he exemplified. Thank you. Thank you. The National Academy of Sciences Award in Molecular Biology, which is supported by Pfizer Incorporated, will be introduced by Marian Carlson, Chair of the Selection Committee. The 2014 National Academy of Sciences Award in Molecular Biology is awarded to David M. Sabatini of Massachusetts Institute of Technology for his discovery of components and regulators of the mTOR kinase pathway and his elucidation of the important roles of the signaling pathway in nutrient sensing, cell physiology, and cancer. This award is given to recognize a notable discovery in molecular biology by a young scientist. And I should note that the Academy defines young as 45 or under. <laughs> so this uh, award has a long and distinguished history. And as those of us who are over 45 may remember, it uh, was formerly the U.S. Steel Award. David Sabatini received his MD-PhD degree from Johns Hopkins in 1997. He then became a Whitehead Fellow and then a member of the Whitehead Institute in 2002. He's also a professor of biology at MIT and investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Sabatini's work on the mTOR pathway began when he was a student at Hopkins, when he identified the mammalian TOR, a protein kinase that is a target of rapamycin, hence the name TOR. 
He went on to discover that mTOR exists in two major complexes that are part of an extensive signaling network in the cell. He has elucidated mechanisms by which mTOR integrates signals from nutrients, stress, and growth factors to regulate cell growth and other fundamental cell processes. His work has also implicated dysregulation of the mTOR pathway in cancer and other uh, human disorders. So I'm pleased to present this award to David today. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to the committee and the uh, selection committee and as well Pfizer for, for the award. I'm very much honored. I'm also deeply humbled when I look at the list of, of prior recipients. I have many people to thank, and of course in 150 words very few can, can make it, but really top of that list is my thesis advisor, Solomon Snyder at Hopkins, who, uh, whose creativity, uh, whose curiosity has really influenced me and drives me uh, still. I want to thank my, the, the members of, of the MIT as well as the Whitehead who not only have given me a job at multiple different stages but also have continuously supported me and, and some of whom are, are here. Of course I want to thank my family who are both scientists and, and physicians and have really supported me in everything I've done. But really I think the, the most important thanks goes to the members of my lab that really nothing is possible without them and, and really every day I wake up excited to work with them. So thank you. And thank you all. Thank you. The G.K. Warren Prize will be introduced by Ture Serling, Chair of the Selection Committee. G.K. Warren, among other things, was a um, Civil War general. Uh, and more important to science, he was one of the first people to do a lot of very large-scale mapping, including mapping of the Upper Mississippi Basin, uh, doing much of the mapping related to the building of the Intercontinental Railroads. And one of the oldest geologic uh, concerns has been how fast do continents uh, erode, how fast are continents built. Um, and uh, Kellen Whipple has been working on this problem for most of his career uh, in the same large scale um, uh, notion of, of, uh, of Warren, but uh, through many, many continents in areas of uh, stable continents, but especially in areas where uh, tectonics have been very important, such as our own Colorado Plateau in this continent, uh, the Andes, and uh, Tibet. And so the 2014 Warren Prize is awarded to Kellen Whipple for his seminal studies in the role of fluvial incision as a key process that links climate, tectonics, and landscape evolution. Ha, huh, wow. Thank you. This is indeed a great honor. Um, and a very humbling honor to look at the website and see my name in the same list of some of the luminaries in, uh, in my field. Um, I have had the good fortune to get to experience some of the same um, adventures of exploration and mapping as uh, G.K. Warren did, and that's an honor to me as well. Um, I've been quite fortunate to also be able to work with some incredible people that have mentored me and guided me, trained me, some of them former recipients of this award as well, and I have owe the most to Bill Dietrich, Tom Dunn, Gary Parker, Chris Paola, Bob Anderson, Greg Tucker, Alan Howard, Kip Hodges, and Peter Molnar. I also want to thank all of my former students and postdocs, current students and postdocs, this is really about them. None of the work could have been done without them, an incredible group of people. Um, Mom, I just want to say, turns out a lack of sense about what's possible isn't all that bad. <laughs> um, and I want to thank especially my beautiful wife, Darla, and my daughters, Tegan and Darren, for all their support and enduring the many times that I was away exploring and especially from during the times when I was present but lost in thoughts about fluvial geomorphology. Thank you. <laughs> the Arthur L. Day Prize and Lectureship will be introduced by Jay Malosh, Chair of the Selection Committee. Jay? We hear a great deal these days about climate change and how our world is changing. The records of climatic change, however, recorded by people writing down thermometer measurements, only goes back barely before 1800. 
To go back further and understand uh, the current climate in the context of our planet's past, one needs to read ancient records and infer what happened long before humans were around to create records. Uh, today's awardee um, is one of those people who has studied ice cores and pushed our record and our detailed understanding of the climate back millions of years into the past and enabled us to put today's climate into context. Uh, because this award is also given for uh, work in applying physics to geology, I have to emphasize that beyond the climate change for which he is deservedly famous, uh, is a great deal of work on the physics of what happens, the details of what goes on as snow turns into ice, how bubbles of air are trapped, and how trace elements in those bubbles get moved around. And so behind the spectacular results that you hear about uh, in the newspapers and in public forums, there is also a great deal of past work in the physics of the underlying processes for which he's responsible. <clears throat> so, it's a great pleasure today to award the 2014 Arthur L. Day Prize and Lectureship to Richard B. Alley of Penn State University for his contributions to understanding Earth's past climate through high precision dating of ice cores and for his elucidation of the physical and chemical processes that govern the accumulation of ice and its movement in glaciers and ice streams. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jay. Ralph thanks the Academy, the Selection Committee, to Larry Edwards, to a remarkable group of, of wonderful colleagues, dear, my dear wife Cindy, our daughters Janet and Karen. When I was in high school, the press discovered climate. The New York Times reported that we faced cooling. The New York Times also reported that we faced warming. That great scientific journal Newsweek caught the cooling one, and some people have never forgotten that. But when the country asked the Academy in the mid-70s, what do we face? It's probably warming, but let's do a little research. By the late 70s, they said warming. In the 80s, the 90s, the 00s, the teens, they said warming. And if you use the scholarship, you will be better off. The lectureship that comes with the prize, I hope to use to continue spreading the word of the assessed science from the academy. If you use the scholarship, you will be better off. Thank you. The National Academy of Sciences Award for Scientific Reviewing which is supported by annual reviews in honor of J. Murray Luck, will be introduced by Professor Cynthia Bell, Chair of the Selection Committee. Cynthia? Good afternoon. We have all said or heard at one time or another when witnessing some odd piece of behavior, ah, that's human nature. Have you ever wondered, how do we know what's human nature? That is what Sarah Hurdy has been asking. Sarah Hurdy has demonstrated the power of bringing systematic observation of behavior of people, non-human primates and other animals, to elaborating hypotheses about the evolution of behavior and evaluating them. And she has not hesitated to take in, on board difficult tasks such as difficult behaviors, including infanticide, ranging from infanticide up to mother love, a wide range of behaviors, and has clearly, she has clearly in her research meticulously documented systematic analyses of behavior to explain what is and how can human behavior evolve. It is therefore a great pleasure to announce the award of the 2014 National Academy of Sciences Award for Scientific Reviewing. It's presented this year in the field of biosocial interactions and is awarded to Sarah B. Hurdy, 
of the University of California, Davis. It's awarded for her insightful and visionary synthesis of a broad range of data and concepts from across the social and biological sciences to illuminate the importance of biosocial processes among mothers, infants, and other social actors in forming the evolutionary crucible of human societies. Sarah. Thank you. I'm uh, obviously very honored to receive this award. I'm also profoundly grateful that such an award is given by the National Academy. So much lip service gets paid to the value of interdisciplinary research at the same time that institutional pressures and the evolving nature of science itself discourages us from actually doing it. Wondrous technological advances in molecular biology, genetics, neuroscience, and other fields fuel increased specialization. The time-saving saving conveniences of online searches, which are wonderful, further compartmentalize knowledge, filtering out serendipitous discovery of wider patterns. Early on, J. Murray Luck, the biochemist, anticipated the need for scientists to integrate new findings and probe them for their wider relevance. And I'm so glad that in spite of the diffuse burden of committee responsibilities it takes that Bob Kirshner mentioned, that in spite of this, that the Academy still gives this award. Thank you. The National Academy of Sciences Award in Chemical Sciences, supported by the Merck Company Foundation, will be introduced by Professor Eric Jacobson, Chair of the Selection Committee. Marvin Carruthers invented a practical method for synthesizing DNA that has helped revolutionize the fields of biochemistry, biology, molecular biology, and biophysical chemistry. The so-called phosphoramidite method he developed allows the synthesis of oligo and polynucleotides on solid support. He had sought a chemical synthesis that was so robust and reliable that it could even be done by biologists <laughs> and in an automated manner. He succeeded, and his method is used throughout the world today in so-called gene machines for the purpose of synthesizing DNA. The technology has been adapted for use with modified inkjet printers in order to synthesize DNA on glass chips. Using this modified chemistry, there are now instruments that synthesize the equivalent of the human genome, six billion coupling reactions in a day. It's my great honor to announce the 2014 National Academy of Sciences Award in Chemical Sciences to, is awarded to Marvin Carruthers of the University of Colorado at Boulder for his pioneering contributions to the chemical synthesis of DNA and RNA that made it possible to decode and encode genes and genomes. When I received the letter from Susan that I was to receive this award, I found it almost unbelievable in view of the enormous accomplishments of previous recipients. For this recognition, I first want to thank the Academy and in particular the Selection Committee whose challenge was to choose from an enormous number of extremely well-qualified scientists. I also want to recognize those who nominated me as their insights about our work and its significance surely created a strong case of support for us. This method for chemically synthesizing DNA and RNA was made possible when Mark Matucci and Serge Bukaj, those are the two gentlemen here, joined my lab as they were a persistent focus and developed, had insights on how, what led to this chemistry, which is still state of the art 30 years later. I also want to recognize former students Bill Epkovich and Kurt Becker, 
who transferred this chemistry to the first successful DNA synthesizers at Applied Biosystems. Finally, I would like to recognize my wife of 34 years, Jenny, deceased in 2006, who was there for me and with me in everything we wanted to do. Without her love and encouragement over the years, I am sure that I would never have attained what success I have had. And now Fiona, to whom I have been married the past few years and is with me today, I also am deeply indebted she has helped me through the dark times and provided the path to get me going again as I now have a new research group doing unexplored and exciting science. Thank you very much. The William O. Baker Award for Initiatives in Research, it's supported by Alcatel-Lucent in honor of William O. Baker, will be introduced by William F. Brinkman, Chair of the Selection Committee. Bill? Well, it's very much a privilege to um, give out the William Baker Award. Bill Baker was a Vice President of Research and President of Bell Laboratories for many, many years and was a tremendous advocate of, of, of basic research in this country, uh, not only at Bell Labs, but in a, on, on a national level. And in fact, he was such an advocate that his most famous quote appeared in the New York Times one Sunday afternoon when he would, they, were, they were pushing him on why we should support science more than we support the arts. And he said, they don't eat Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's do you? <laughs> and if that quote is forever known. Today we're recognizing, uh, I should remind everyone that this prize is actually for young scientists. And so it's young here means 35 or less years old. And so it's for very young folks doing, uh, doing um, excellent science. And in, the interesting feature of, uh, today is that in some sense, this award represents a new era in chemistry and material science in that now, inst instead of saying, well, let's uh, see if we can make a certain material, people first say, well, let's simulate it and see what we get. And, then, and, and so the simulation of materials and chemistry has changed enormously in the last 10 years. It is largely because of folks like the awardee today, namely Garnet Chenlik Chayan, who has, who has greatly contributed in his short career to the advancing this subject of simulation in, in materials and chemistry. In fact, he has done it from two points of view. One is in actual simulation of uh, specific materials like graphene uh, uh, nano ribbons uh, or um, organic electronic materials um, or metal enzymes. He's, he does simulations of all these things. But he also has done a develop, uh, helped to develop the new technology that has allowed these simulations to be as accurate as they are. And so for his pioneering research in the field of numerical simulation, of highly correlated quantum systems in chemistry and physics, particularly for his development of density matrix renormalization group methods and for density matrix embedding theory, we award him the W.O. Baker Award. So first I'd like to thank the National Academy for presenting me with the Baker Award. Uh, when I look at the list of previous recipients, I feel especially honored. Now I'm a theoretician, and a man of simple tastes. Uh, but with the award, now I know I can go to the stationery store and buy any pencil I want. <laughs> Finally, this award is only possible because of the support I've always received, first from my parents, now from my lovely wife, Claire, who is here with me today. And of course, because of the fantastic group of students and postdocs that I've had the privilege to work with. So this, is award, this award is really for all of them and I thank you very much. The Troll and Research Awards, two of them, will be introduced by Terence J. Sanofsky, a chair of the selection committee. Terry? Um, the um, Troll and Award takes on a very special significance this year. It's been about a year since President Obama announced the Brain Initiative on April 2nd last year. This particular award 
is a special one because it is for uh, psychology and psychology, advances in psychology, uh, which show a special relationship between consciousness and the physical world. And, and this is one of the goals of the Brain Initiative, is to understand the physical substrate in the brain, giving rise to perception, memory, ultimately understanding the physical basis of consciousness. Now, Leonard Trollin has a, is a fascinating uh, person and a very appropriate, uh, actually, for uh, the, this award uh, and also the Brain Initiative. He was a psychologist and uh, expert on the uh, area of, of vision. Uh, he was president of the Optical Society of America. But he was also a engineer. In fact, he was the chief engineer of the Technicolor Motion Picture Corporation. Uh, and, uh, and so he had two hats, and this is what the Brain Initiative is trying to bring together, the engineers, the physicists, and the mathematicians, together with the biologists and neuroscientists, to develop new innovative technologies for understanding brain function. Sad footnote, uh, in 1932, he was posing for a photo op on Mount Wilson, where the Great Telescope sits, on the edge of a precipice, fainted, and fell to his death at the age of 43. This thought occurred to me as we were posing on the steps <laughs> of the Einstein statue. The first uh, awardee, Uli Rudishauser, was trained at Caltech in the computation and neural science uh, neurosciences training program, neural systems training program. This is the first program, in, to my knowledge, in the U.S., which was bringing physicists and mathematicians and uh, engineers into a biological uh, context to try to develop uh, neural models and new approaches for analyzing neural data, which is another central feature of the Brain Initiative. Now, uh, he has done something very unusual, which is most uh, neuroscientists who study uh, the brain, for example, record from neurons in monkeys or cats or zebrafish, you know, the entire Noah's Ark. He has recorded from single neurons in humans. And this is done in the operating room uh, when electrodes are implanted in patients with epilepsy in order to be able to localize the source of the epilepsy and also to be able to spare the important language areas. But taking the opportunity of embedded electrodes for several weeks, it's possible to do science. And he was one of the pioneers in doing that uh, with his mentors at Caltech. Uh, he has uh, un unearthed, and this is a wake behaving human being that we're recording from, uh, the properties of single neurons in the visual system, in the hippocampus, uh, properties that, that reflect what we think. Everything that we know about the world, our, carried by these neurons and the spikes that trans are transferred between them. And, uh, and understanding how that information is carried by the neurons is central to understanding brain function. Uh, he's uh, worked on many different uh, problems. In fact, most recently, uh, he had a paper in PNAS in which uh, he studied uh, synthesizing cognition in neuromorphic electronic systems. So his, his interests extend not just to the brain, but to building new devices that work like brains. So uh, let me read the citation to uh, Uli Rudishauser for his innovative experimental and computational studies to understand human perception and memory. Uli. Thank you, Terry, for these uh, very kind remarks. It is a tremendous honor for me to be awarded the Trolland Award. Uh, I deeply appreciate this recognition and I thank the Academy and the Selection Committee for this great honor. Many people have uh, influenced and shaped my path, and without them, I would not be where I am today. First, I would like to thank my family, particularly my mother and my wonderful fiance, Amy Chow. Secondly, I would like to acknowledge the tremendous influence my mentors and advisors had on me. In order of first appearance, these are Rodney Douglas, Pietro Perona, Christoph Koch, Aaron Schumann, Adam Mamlock, Ralph Adolphs and Chilleron. 
I would further like to express my deep appreciation to my current uh, colleagues and collaborators, which are Jeffrey Chung, Adam Mamluck, Ralph Adolphs, Keith Black, as well as all the members of my lab. Last but uh, certainly not least, I would like to express my appreciation to all the patients who have participated in our research. Thank you for this great honor. The second honoree of the Trollin Award is Rebecca Sachs from MIT. And her particular interest uh, is the human mind. But not just the mind, but where is it in the brain? Now this is a topic of great uh, uh, interest, not just to scientists, but as you'll see, to technologists. Last December, at a workshop of the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference and Workshop, I had the uh, interesting opportunity to talk to Mark Zuckerberg, who is the CEO of Facebook. Now, what was Mark Zuckerberg doing at a scientific meeting? Well, he was there because a lot of his employees that he's trying to recruit are people in machine learning who happened to be at this meeting, and it was a particular workshop that he was going to uh, have be uh, on a panel. So he was there because he was interested in the science. Now, when, when he heard that I was a neuroscientist, he asked me about the theory of mind. What did we know? What did we know about the, how human beings conceptualize other people in terms of what their minds are like? And I was very fortunate to tell him that you're lucky you're talking to the right person. I have just read the complete works of Rebecca Sachs. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he said, that's wonderful. Could you send me some references? And I said, sure. Where, where should I send them? I'm not sure if I should actually give this e email out, but <laughs> mark at FB. <laughs> so Rebecca has had a, a truly uh, wonderful and stellar career in developing really very clever experiments, psychological experiments, but also pairing that with uh, brain imaging recordings to try to tease apart how different parts of the human brain interacting with each other give rise to our ability to be able to read other people's minds. What, what are they thinking? What are they likely to do under different circumstances? Do other animals have uh, similar abilities? These are all questions which are very, very uh, interesting and exciting. And, and by the way, if you're asking, the, if you want to know why was Mark interested in that question, just think about it. He has more data about more people's minds than anybody on the planet. And his goal is to develop a theory of everybody's mind. <laughs> now, in addition to the theory of mind, Rebecca has also been uh, very, very uh, uh, active in understanding brain development, how does that arise in the brain, our ability to understand uh, how other people behave, moral reasoning, causal reasoning, and language. This covers, this covers the, the whole range of interesting cognitive behaviors that we as humans have, which, make, which are unique abilities in many respects. So uh, let me read the uh, citation to Rebecca Sachs, who was awarded the 2014 Troll and Research Award for discovering the part of the human brain specialized for understanding what other people are thinking. Rebecca. Thanks, Terry, and to the whole academy. I noticed next door that there was a lunch for women in science, and so I'm particularly pleased to be able to thank my three amazing mentors, uh, Kia Nobre, Nancy Kenosher, who herself won the Trilland Award, and Susan Carey. And I take it that one of my key responsibilities is to pass this on in mentoring the next generation of women scientists. And being in Washington, I thought about this quote apocryphally attributed to Alan Greenspan. Apparently, he once said, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard was not what I meant. <laughs> 
So it's amazing that he could produce that sentence and amazing that I could memorize it. But what's even more ma amazing is that somewhere in your brain, a pattern of neurons firing in space and time let you understand it. And that's the craziest idea I've ever heard and certainly worth a career trying to understand. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think I understood that, but thank you. <laughs> the National Academy of Sciences Award for the Industrial Application of Science was established by the IBM Corporation in honor of uh, our colleague, Ralph E. Gomery. It will be introduced by Richard A. Dixon, chair of the selection committee. The NAS Award for the Industrial Application of Science is uh, presented to a scientist who has shown original scientific work of intrinsic scientific importance and with significant benefits, uh, beneficial applications in industry. And the 2014 award was, uh, was to be awarded in the field of, of bioenergy, uh, a very interesting field right now. Uh, a recent uh, National Research Council um, report uh, questioned whether we were actually going to be able to meet uh, the requirements for the renewable fuel standard uh, in, uh, over the next, uh, the next period and pointed out that um, absent technological innovation, and this phrase came up again and again in the report, uh, we may not meet it. Uh, and the recipient of the current award is one of the people who has provided exactly that technological innovation uh, to help us where, where we need to be in the biofuels uh, arena. So it's great pleasure to uh, award, uh, to present this award to uh, James Liao uh, from the University of California of Los Angeles. Uh, the citation states that he has developed the technologies that enable production of higher alcohols as drop-in fuels from sugars, from cellulose, from waste proteins, or carbon dioxide. This is moving us away from ethanol and into more useful things like, like, like isobutanol and compounds of that sort. Uh, and in relation to the intrinsic uh, science part of the award, uh, his work uh, recognizes the cutting edge in the industrial application of synthetic biology. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the selection committee for choosing me to receive this award. And by receiving this award, I don't want to give people a wrong impression that our energy problem has been solved. <laughs> And a lot more work needs to be done. We are using a lot of energy more than our brain does. Of course, brain is important, but uh, energy is equally important, if not more so. So we need a lot more people, scientists, and government officials to participate in this, in this work. Of course, my work would not be possible without my very capable group of former students and current students and postdocs. So to, to them, I'm deeply appreciated. And of course, my work will not be possible without the unlimited support and love for my family and my wife. And thank, I thank them very much. The Prado Research Award will be introduced by Eve Martyrs, Chair of the Selection Committee. Eve? I know that many of you spend hours and days walking through the woods looking at animals in their natural environments. The field of neuroethology is a field that tries to understand the neural mechanisms underlying complex animal behaviors of all kinds. And of course, we hope that many of those lessons will be relevant to human behavior as well. Birdsong is one of the most fascinating problems, many of you also like birds, I'm sure. And um, many birds learn their songs from tutors, from their families. And the bird song preparation has been extremely useful for understanding learning, the acquisition of motor sequences, motor, motor function, and sensory motor integration, auditory processing, a whole raft of really fundamental um, biological processes. Allison Dope has been a leader in the field of neuroethology using birdsong for almost 30 years, ever since I can remember. 
I don't remember very well anymore, but ever since I can remember. And what's really remarkable about Allison and her influence on the field is the birdsong system has attracted some of the most imaginative, creative, and outstanding investigators. And to a large degree, that's because of Allison's leadership and mentorship of a very large fraction of young people, very, very fine young people who've been drawn to the field. So the 2014 Prattle Research Award is awarded to Allison Dope of the University of California, San Francisco for her groundbreaking word work using songbirds to reveal important features of how neural circuits process information and are shaped by experience. I'm delighted and honored to be uh, chosen for this award and um, many thanks to the National Academy and the committee. Uh, I, uh, there are so many people to thank, starting with my parents who supported my education in all ways and early on got me interested in language learning growing up in Quebec. And so there's a direct line from that early experience to my study of vocal learning in songbirds as a model system for this. Uh, I also benefited from fantastic teachers in graduate school and postdoctoral training, uh, Paul Patterson, uh, Story Landis and Mark Kanishi especially, and the wonderful collegial environment that I've had at UCSF since I uh, became a professor. And of course, most of all, the award honors the talented students and postdocs I've had over the years and continue to have. It remains one of the most fun things in my daily life and the business of running a lab to, to work with my students and postdocs. And um, last of and mentors from many other uh, universities as well. Uh, and last but not least, I, uh, I thank my partner in life and in science, Michael Brainerd, and our two boys, who I hope are watching this podcast, but I know that they would rather be watching a fishing video. <laughs> the National Academy of Sciences award uh, the prize in physiological let me start over. The Psychological and Cognitive Sciences Award. This is a, a new award. We're very proud to present, and it will be introduced by Michael Posner, Chair of the Selection Committee. I would like to thank Professor Richard Atkinson for his great donation to the National Academy of Science in recognition of the contributions from psychological and cognitive science to the present scene in science. The selection was very difficult for this first year because of the outstanding number of candidates from around the world who were proposed for this award during its first year. Professor Atkinson was gracious to allow two awards this first year, even though the actual award will be only offered every other year in the future. But uh, the committee that uh, looked over the many outstanding contributors and nominees involve Susan Carey, Nancy Canwisher, Pim LaBelt, and David Meyer. And uh, we were led into the right path by Sally Schwetman, who guided our uh, work all along the way. So I'm very grateful to the committee and to Sally, and particularly to Dr. Atkinson for allowing this award. And I'm very pleased to announce that the award will be given to Professor James L. McClellan, the Lucy Stern Professor at Stanford University and Director of the Mind, Brain, and Computation Institute there. The citation reads, for his seminal contribution to the empirical investigation and theoretical characterization of human perception, learning, memory, language, and other basic mental processes through detailed, precise, connectionist neural, model, neural network modeling. The work of Jay McClellan has not, only been, has not only given and will give great leadership within psychological and cognitive science, but his work is appreciated by those many scientists in many fields interested in intelligence. I'm very pleased to give him the reward this year. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the award selection committee for 
choosing me among the many outstanding candidates who uh, they considered this year for this first awarding of this prize. I want to tell you that we characterize the approach we take uh, as uh, parallel distributed processing. We've, we're trying to understand the way in which mind emerges from the interactions of large numbers of tiny computing elements, the neurons that compose your brain. And uh, all this, though this approach is often called neural networks and connectionism, uh, I like the image of parallel distributed processing uh, because it, it captures the uh, essential element of many uh, elements all working simultaneously to give rise to uh, our sense of who we are, our experience of the world, our understanding of language, and uh, the nature of our minds. It also, for me, captures the essential feature of uh, the work, which has been that it was itself a collaboration of many individuals working together in a parallel and distributed way, sharing ideas with each other, cross-fertilizing each other's thoughts, uh, and um, providing each other with the tools for advancing these ideas. In 1986, with uh, David Rummelhart and a large group of other people, we published a two-volume work called Parallel Distributed Processing, which introduced these ideas and really was the collective effort of a large team. I'd like to especially recognize David, David Rummelhart, uh, who really was the prime mover of our vision at that time, the, uh, the man who introduced the algorithm that is currently powering most of the uh, powerful algorithms in machine learning, and an intellectual leader par excellence. Of course, I'd also like to acknowledge the many who've come after that initial group, uh, who've continued to develop the ideas. Uh, that were represented in our, our earlier work. Before I conclude, I'd like to make two more brief acknowledgments. First, echoing Mike, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Richard Atkinson, who uh, I don't know if you know, he was the director of the National Science Foundation for many years and the president of the University of California. He's been a tremendous advocate for the social and behavioral sciences. And uh, through creating this prize, I think uh, I, I just feel he's done something uh, to help place our sciences uh, more fully in front of the public as an important set of contributing disciplines to science in general. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge my social support network, which is here today. Uh, my wife, Heidi, uh, many of our dear friends represented by uh, two of them who are here, and my parents, uh, Frana and Mac McClelland, uh, who I'm really uh, very pleased and honored to uh, be able to say uh, have been able to join us here today. Thank you all very much. Arguably, one of the most important things any scientific community could do is mentor the next generation. The second winner of the Psychological and Cognitive Science Award for this year has done more than perhaps anyone else to help us understand the, infant, the mind of the infant and the young child. The award is to Elizabeth S. Spelke, the Marshall Berkman Professor at Harvard University for her groundbreaking studies of infant perception, infant representation of number, and infant knowledge of the physical and the social world, as well as studies of continuity and discontinuity in ontogeny. Congratulations, Elizabeth. So it is a great privilege to work in the fields of psychology and cognitive science at a time uh, when these fields are broadening and deepening in ways we've partly heard about uh, today, and, in, and also able to address 
ancient yet perpetually fascinating questions uh, about human knowledge and human nature. I think it's ever more clear that the methods of science can shed light on these questions, uh, revealing things about ourselves uh, that are uh, important for us to know and that also uh, give us perspective that we need uh, in order to uh, live together in an increasingly interconnected world and educate our children uh, in, in a world that's ever more rapidly uh, changing. So I too want to add my thanks to Richard Atkinson and to the National Academy for establishing this award to mark both the progress and the promise of this field. Uh, now as Jay just said, to do science is to collaborate. Uh, and so the, the award that's coming to me is actually honoring a large number of people. Uh, too many for me to list without going way over my uh, word count and keeping you from the uh, garden party. I do want to mention two people, uh, uh, two of my teachers who are no longer here. Uh, Ulrich Neisser, who along with uh, Mike Posner uh, and others has been an inspiration uh, uh, to the field that he called cognitive psychology. And Eleanor Gibson, who remains to this day the best experimental uh, psychologist that I've ever known. Uh, the rest of my many collaborators, as I said, are too numerous to name, but the good news is you all know uh, who you are. Uh, you're my uh, mentors at Penn and at MIT, uh, who gave me the great joy of being a student three times over. Uh, you're the best possible group of peers and friends who've been sharing ideas with me for 30-some uh, years now. Uh, you're the brilliant younger collaborators who keep, keep me on my toes, something I need more and more as the years go by. Uh, and finally, and especially, uh, you're my students uh, who've taken the lead on every uh, line of research uh, on all these guys and others that's ever been conducted in my lab and who've taught me so much. Thank you. Our final award today is the National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Medal, and it will be introduced by Professor Susan Wessler, our Home Secretary of the Academy. Sue? The 2014 National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Medal is awarded to John Edward Porter, former member of Congress and currently partner in the law firm of Hogan Lovells and chair of research exclamation point, America. The Public Welfare Medal is the highest honor of the National Academy of Sciences and is presented annually by the Council of the Academy in recognition of distinguished contributions in the application of science to the public welfare. It was, what, what I hadn't realized in here is the award was established in 1914. So, as Mary Woolley pointed out before, this is the 100th year of this incredibly prestigious award. The citation for John Porter reads as follows. In recognition of decades of advocacy on behalf of scientific and medical research, being a leader, a leading champion of American science and medicine, and his efforts to garner support for research that has enabled countless advances that otherwise might not have been possible. Because this is our, our highest award, um, I'm given a little bit of time, a little bit of extra time, to introduce um, John Porter, also because usually the award is not a scientist and we may not be as familiar with him. He is also given a little bit more time um, to accept the award. So I want to start by saying John Porter was born in Evanston, Illinois. He got his undergraduate degrees from Northwestern. He got his um, JD, Juris Doctor degree with distinction from the University of Michigan Law School. He served as an honor law, in the honor law graduate program at the US Department of Justice with Attorney General Robert Kennedy in the early 60s where he first saw the possibilities of addressing problems through work in government. He practiced law from 1963 to 1979 in Evanston, Illinois. Beginning in 1980, he served for 21 years as a Republican member of Congress from the 10th District of Illinois. As chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee that had purview over the budgets of the NIH, 
CDC, and various education agencies, he decided to push for an increase in, in NIH funding at a time when the Republican-controlled Congress, following the 1994 election, was set on a course of cu cutting federal spending. His commitment, hard work, and passion on behalf of medical research successfully garnered and sustained the largest funding increases in the history of NIH at a time when other budgets were being dramatically slashed. In his nomination packet, there were numerous examples of his really special activities um, in, as a congressman. One of his letter writers wrote, Every year, he devoted three weeks of his legislative calendar to hearing from the directors of all of the NIH institutes and centers. That effort was supplemented by his attention to the concerns of professional organizations, institutions in the academic and private sectors, individual scientists, and patient ad advocacy groups. He immersed himself in the detailed working of the agencies under his purview while not losing sight of the big picture, namely the scientific mission to make discoveries and to apply our science to the improvements of public health. He brought his passion for biomedical sciences to his party leadership and working across the aisle, in parenthesis, in a manner that is all too unusual in today's Congress, to ensure success. In addition to um, being a member of a law firm and being the chair of Research America, he is vice chair of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. He is a member of the boards of the PBS Foundation, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Bretton Woods Committee. Previously, he was chairman of PBS and served on the boards of the Rand Corporation, the American Heart Association, the Brookings Institution, and the Population Research Center. He was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2007. Among his over 200 awards and recognitions for outstanding service, I've chosen two which I think really stand out. He received the 2000, in, in the year 2000, the Mary Lasker Award for Public Service for wise and perceptive leadership on behalf of medical research. Um, part of the citation said he possesses a masterful ability to translate medical research, science, and technological advances into a language that leaders can understand, apply to their own lives, and relate to the economic future of our country. He has worked skillfully behind the scenes to educate his colleagues about obstacles to science progress and to the promises of research in terms of prevention, treatment, and cure for mankind's most dreaded diseases. He initiated day trips to NIH for members of Congress to see firsthand the research underway and to better understand the potential of this research to improve human life. The other distinction, which is, is, is pretty remarkable, um, he, um, his leadership in furthering biomedical research um, has been recognized um, in uh, the dedication of the John Edward Porter Neuroscience Research Center. Where, where the second phase was, in fact, dedicated last month on the NIH campus. The building's 600,000 square feet of space is among the largest of NIH's 68 buildings and brings together to work side by side, and what I, from what I understand, for either the first time or, or the second time, brings together scientists from 11 of NIH's different institutes who have traditionally worked at distant sites. So I'm going to end on a bit of a corny note. In considering John Porter's contributions to science for the public good, I kept recalling the movie, which I actually like and I know a lot of people don't like, It's a Wonderful Life, which imagines a world without George Bailey, as played by Jimmy Stewart. In that vein, I ask, where would biomedical research be today if John Porter had not advocated for it at a critical time when other budgets were being slashed? In answer, Many discoveries would not have been made, therapies would not be available, and many breakthroughs would not be on the horizon. Clearly, we live in a better world because of the contributions of our public welfare recipient, John Edward Porter. Susan, uh, thank you so much. That means a great deal to me. Dr. Cicerone, I'm deeply grateful to you and the Academy 
for this high honor, perhaps the highest in my long life. I want especially to congratulate the scientists recognized here this afternoon. I'm proud and humbled to be on the same stage being recognized with all of you. I am, of course, not a scientist, but a science advocate. I have been fascinated my entire life with science and fortunately attained some understanding of it at MIT before deciding I would follow in my father's footsteps as an attorney. And I know you're sitting there thinking, what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> I had the good record at MIT, all of it translated to Northwestern University from which I graduated three years later with a degree in pre-law. I was motivated to save NIH as the new chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee from extraordinary cuts in the 1995 House budget, the Republican budget, I might add, and later the double funding for NIH from $13.5 billion to $27 billion. I was fortunate through several serendipitous occurrences in my political career uh, in and be in the right place at the right time under the right circumstances to make these things happen. What motivated me? My father was afflicted with polio as a child, walked his entire life with a brace on his leg. When the soft vaccine was discovered in, in uh, 1952 when I was 17 years old, the enormous potential for improved human health through medical research was brought home to me in a very personal way. I've said for years now that America's economic destiny has to be science, innovation, technology, and research. They drive our economy, provide good jobs at good salaries, and raise our people's standard of living. To ensure the, this future, a strong commitment to STEM education is necessary. But much more is needed, and the only ones able to create, to make that happen, are you, the leaders of science. This is what I want to talk to you about this afternoon. Inspiration is also needed not only to bring young people to careers in science, but to give the American people an appreciation for science and support for making federal funding for basic research a very high national priority. Beginning during and shortly after World War II until 2001, science occupied an envied position in our nation's priorities and received strong and sustained federal funding. With little interruption until 9-11 and the unnecessary wars and unwise tax cuts that followed, scientific research has had tireless advocates, congressional champions, and more or less priority in our list of federal investments important to the future. But that has become, over the last decade, an artifact of the past with a group of anti-government legislators and an American electorate largely ignorant of science and, in some cases, hostile to it. <clears throat> a member of Congress said not long ago that, quote, evolution, embryology, and the Big Bang theories are lies. From, the straight, from straight from the pit of hell, meant to convince people that they do not need a savior. That congressman is a medical doctor, serves on the House Science Committee, and is now running for the United States Senate. In 1945, Vannevar Bush in the Endless Frontier urged that our country keep social and political interference out of curiosity-driven science. He said that freedom of inquiry must be preserved under any plan 
for government support of science. I can't speak for the physical sciences, but in our subcommittee, for all the years up through the time that I chaired it, it was an article of faith that political judgment should never be allowed to substitute for scientific judgment. But in about uh, 2004, after I had retired from Congress, <clears throat> amendments began being offered on the House floor to prevent funding for medical research in subjects a member didn't think appropriate. One such amendment was aimed at research on human sex and was supported by nearly half the members of the House of Representatives being defeated by a single vote 2011 to 2012. In addition, in this Congress and the, and the previous one, one of our political parties has done everything possible to preserve funding for health, to prevent funding for health services research, the kind that would tell us what works in health care and what doesn't. And those of you who are funded by or work with NSF know the same thing is going on in respect to the social sciences in that agency. Another place where science is under attack is in the federal budget and appropriations process, as you well know. I don't know who's that is. <clears throat> now, I believe very strongly that reducing our federal deficits and debt is a very necessary part to our economic stability and strength. But the real money needed to control our long-term deficit can be found in, the, in entitlement reform and tax reform and yet the Congress and the administration do not have the courage to address them. Instead, <clears throat> through, budget, through the Budget Control Act and sequestration, deficit reduction today is aimed only at the places where national priorities should be the greatest. That is, science, education, infrastructure, and national defense and where investments must be made if we are to preserve the American leadership and the American economic future. All of these <coughs> anti-science uh, sentiments among the people and some of the, our elected officials, attempts to substitute political judgment for scientific, deficit reduction approached by cutting science and other places where we must uh, invest to, to secure our future. All of these are serious challenges that must not be allowed to stand. C.P. Snow, in his famous lecture in 1959, said that there is a gulf of mutual incomprehension uh, and a mu and mutual lack of sympathy and appreciation between literary intellectuals and natural scientists. That has widely been interpreted to be a gulf of mutual incomprehension between scientists and the lay public. But apparently these recent attacks, attacks have not uh, moved the science community to take action. In effect, the leaders of science give the impression that the public is not important to the future of science, at least not important enough to commit much, if any, of a scientist's time and energy to defend it. Yes, science groups are concerned with these attacks and, and editorialize among their members and themselves, but little has been said directly to the American public. And I see no instance where the entire science community joined together in denouncing them. Furthermore, during the years after Snow's 1959 warning, there has been little outreach 
to the American people so that they become, uh, they come to understand the importance of science and its tremendous contributions to our well-being. At most researched institutions in this country, there seems to be no reward for public engagement and in many of them, a clear penalty for doing so. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, there has been little outreach by individual scientists to our beleaguered public schools, where many of our science teachers with a little or no background, have little or no background, little outreach to talk with impressionable young people and inspire them to careers in science. There have been very few scientists serving in public office to explain science to their fellow elected officials who need to have some understanding. With the retirement of physicist Rush Holt of New Jersey, exactly two members of the House will remain with any real science background, and that's out of 435 members, or less than one half of 1%. Even a scientist running for public office without any real chance to win would still provide a platform to discuss science with the electorate. Think about it. It's a chance to reach people. To my knowledge, few scientists engage in political campaigns. No volunteering to form a science advisory committee for a candidate. And few scientists raising any questions or making any statements regarding science in the course of candidates' debates. Few scientists offer to speak to the service clubs in their communities about science or about their own research. And this would give lay people an understanding and inspiration where scientific opportunities have never been greater and public, the public needs to have some insight into the progress that is being made. I could go on and on, but you should know that in survey after survey of Research America, few people can name even one research scientist, and few can name any institution that does research even in the areas where they live. Think about that. Can't name one single scientist, can't name any research institution doing any work in the place where they live. Yes, that says a great deal about the people of this country, but it says even more about scientists and their lack of engagement with the public. Does all this really matter, matter to the future of science? Does it matter if the American people have a uh, appreciation for and an understanding of the importance of science to our future? Abraham Lincoln signed the charter of this establishment, this organization, uh, at the National Academy in 1863. Lincoln not only understood the importance of science to our country, he understood the importance of mobilizing public opinion to what gets accomplished in government. He spoke of the subject many times, but most directly perhaps in the first Lincoln-Douglas debate where he said, with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. I realize and apologize for coming here to be honored and taking this as an opportunity to say things that perhaps you don't want to hear. But I think you should hear them. The bottom line is that science in government today is under siege. It is time is a time when science needs defenders. In Research America's surveys, scientists are cons consistently ranked as the most respected people in our nation. Aren't scientists themselves the logical defenders? And will others defend science if you yourselves are unwilling to do so? We will launch a national campaign working with the NAS leadership and others willing to defend and spread the good word about science, together with media, to bring home to the country the vital role of science and technology to our future. 
We will do so if you and your uh, colleagues, that is, America's estimated 350,000 scientists, will take off your lab coats, roll up your sleeves, and engage your friends, your neighbors, and the people of your communities and states to preserve America as the world's leader in science, technology, innovation, and research. This must be our country's destiny, and we must make it a reality, working together. May I express my deepest gratitude on your allowing me to join the elite company of the past public welfare medal recipients and the illustrious scientists we honor here today. And thank you for listening to me.